Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and uh, we're going to be just talking about the nature of history. Uh, this is just going to be a, a long series of videos that that um, we'll be discussing in history are going to be bored out of the tears. Uh, this series will be a long series we'll be looking at historians such as Herodotus, uh, Tacitus, Josephus, uh, we'll be going to Persian history, uh, all the various ancient historians and we'll be discussing, uh, you can discuss underneath the video some of the questions that um, we we will have and it's just a subject that I find fascinating it's a subject that I find truly interesting and something that I've been studying for quite some time now I recently bought a book called A History of Histories uh, Epics, Chronicles, Romances, Inquiries from Herodotus to History John Burrow uh, published by Penguin Books, and it's a book that I really relished and really was looking forward to reading. And I've now got the book, and I'm the first two chapters. So we'll be talking about those two chapters, uh, what I've learned from those two chapters, and we'll also be dipping into uh, Michael R. Lycona's book on the resurrection of Jesus. So. Um, I hope that that's going to be uh, a blessing for you and I hope that you will truly uh, find something to inspire you. Um, now I did a sermon and I'm trying to find the video, it's not come up yet. So. Um, little bit disappointed that uh, I've actually done a sermon and uh, can't find that sermon around so so there we are forgive me for just a minute um, see if we can get it on a So you could just have a, a break for a minute uh, while I just try to, if, if anyone got the, uh, the sermon, a copy of the sermon, if you could let me have a copy, because I can't seem to find the Google Hangout that I've just done, <laughs> for whatever reason, if anybody knows what the reason might be, why I can't find it, I'd be very appreciative, because... Uh, put a lot of effort into that message and I don't want to lose it so if anyone knows how I've lost my Google Hangouts uh, message I will be very grateful so there we are so I'm just going to try and find it somewhere else <laughs> so anyhow before we go to the details of the book um, uh, and reflect on it. I want to give a good shout out to um, this lady, I don't know if you can hear her. Can you hear her? That's uh, Paloma Faith and I want to give a big shout out to her and her music. I've been in, in she has been really really good Paloma Faith, Only Love Can Hurt Like This, what a great song, really enjoyed it today, listening to that, played it uh, a number of times uh, today. Uh, so bear with me, um, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about one or two things that have happened the last day or two, uh, barring the uh, you know what happened, but we'll not be talking about that specific thing. Um, so if anybody can give me a comment 
and let me know what might have happened to that Google Hangout that I just did because I can't seem to find it so we'll see if we can get it another way so what has happened we'll do talk a, a bit about personal stuff and uh, go on to to uh, to uh, Sorry about this. We'll get there eventually. Just bear with me just for a second. I'm just getting in to Has someone made a comment? Someone has that be great. Matthew has invited me to a Google Hangout. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm going to be just doing this at the moment, mate. So, very kind of you, sir. All right. Right, so there's nothing there. I'm a bit disappointed, really. I don't know where it's gone. Someone's just sent me a, a nice message, so that's very kind of them. Where's that Google Hangout gone, folks? Does anybody know? Can anybody enlighten me? Does anybody know where that Google Hangout went? If anyone can let me know, because I've done a Google Hangout. Here we are. Thank you. <laughs> Is this a Google Hangout? Thanks, bro. Thanks a lot. Let's see if this is the Hangout. I, I had a Google Hangout where I preached and I can't find it, folks. So I, I maybe have changed the settings. Oh, that's... Yeah. 
you hear that? No, I'm looking for the sermon. I'm looking for the sermon I just did. You know the sermon I just did? Does anybody know where it's gone? Because I can't find it on my channel. It's kind of disappeared. So if anyone knows where it is, if anyone's kept a copy, could you send it me? Because I have not got a clue where it's gone and I would love to know where it is. Yep, someone's made a comment. I'm looking for the sermon. Anybody knows where the sermon is? I just did a sermon. And uh, if anybody knows, I would very much appreciate it. Have I, have I put settings on wrong or something? I changed my settings the other day. So, anyhow, if someone could message me and let me know, I did a Google Hangout about half an hour ago. It was a preach, and it's gone. So, okay, thank you. Uh, so it's uh, it's gone. So I don't know. There we are. It's it's gone. It's a shame. And then the settings have got rid of it. Anyhow, is it advanced settings? Anyhow, I can't work it out. I'm not technical. I've done something and I've lost it. So, anyhow. Anyhow, never mind about that. That's a shame. I really enjoyed preaching that sermon as well. If anybody kept a copy of it, let me know and send it me, because I really appreciate being able to put that back on. And it, I bet when I've done this, I'll probably lose this, because I don't know how to save this, so never mind. So... This is J Ball on technical. Okay. All right, we'll get on with the topic. I went to my auntie's uh, birthday on, uh, when was it? Friday night. Uh, she's mentally handicapped and uh, she's 50 years of age. And uh, it was very touching, really. Um, there was about 30, 40 of us there. Uh, my brother was there, sister. Uh, and uh, I had another auntie who's got some learning difficulties and she wanted to come, so I had to leave the party. Then I went to pick her up. And she was. She, she came in her pajama pants. She's about 60. Um, I said, there's a party on, and she said, there's a party? I went, yeah, do you want to come? She says, I'm not ready. I said, well, you can come if you want. So she put a coat on, which was like a yellow tracksuit top coat. She had a cap that was something out of Only Fools and Horses, like one of these grandpa caps. And she had some white pyjama bottoms. I kid you not. <laughs> and we drove up to the party, so I gets her there, I buys her uh, a pint, because she likes a lager, and she was happy as Larry, 
then she was sat next to my other auntie uh, who she she um, when she was nine um, I'm not going to say my, what my auntie's name is uh, but when she was nine she was a normal person and then uh, thinking about this I, I I was only told this recently uh, my by my mum. I didn't know this until recently, only a few weeks ago. But um, my auntie at nine was playing um, in uh, in the uh, changing rooms of where they were like going into the sports hall, and she fell on some coat hangers and she smashed her head. And from that day on, she became mentally handicapped. Her brain just became the brain of a child, or kept as a brain of a child. And she had these terrible fits, I mean, uncontrolled, that was so bad that after a couple of years of living at home, that they couldn't look after her. It was so bad. And so then she had to go and live in a home and I was really uh, I, I didn't even know the full story and, and uh, so when I went to the party on uh, Friday night and I saw her and she she was half with it and she wasn't she was she, she half with it but she didn't really understand that it was her birthday party she she wasn't fully Fully, uh, fully with it. She was. She had a coloring book, and uh, she was coloring. And uh, but it was good to see uh, all my family there. It was mainly my mum's side uh, with there, and it, that was really nice, really. Uh, uh, one of my mum's brothers got up with his wife, started dancing, having a laugh. <laughs> so I got up started boogieing like John Travolta in front of my aunties uh, who had learning difficulties and I had everybody in stitches because I was doing like these funny dances just like doing John Travolta dances and I had uh, I had everyone roaring with laughter and uh, impressed a few people they said hey Jay you've got some moves there bro so that's what I did on Friday night I was at my auntie's party, my mum's home. Um, she, uh, she was. I didn't. I, I didn't want to say where she was, but she went on holiday to, to, um, and she was on holiday. And anyhow, when she had the heart attack, uh, she was rushed into Blackpool Hospital. And um, it all kicked off because she's got diabetes and she wasn't taking her tablets, which thins her blood. And because it didn't, she weren't taking the tablets. It didn't thin her blood, and it gave her a heart attack. So they rushed her in, and they did some kind of operation. They put something in, and it kind of—I don't know what it was—but it stabilised her. And uh, when she came out of operating theatre. Uh, we were there about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was me, my sisters, my brother, and it was really, really scary because it was touch and go. Because I thought maybe she might die. You know, it, it was really pretty scary. But then, amazingly, they brought her out of theatre and they put her in this room, and um, and we could go in and we were allowed to talk to her. But when we went to talk to her, there's two or three of us. She started having a fit. She she uh, she was really having this fit, and uh, every, like all the nurses said, get out, get out, and people rushed in to the thing to see to her. And uh, she, so we stayed out for a while, and then we were allowed back in. And what it was apparently that when they were doing the operation, they didn't put her to sleep whatever it was they, they didn't put us to sleep they put something inside her and so she wasn't asleep so she was aware of what was going on 
So when she came out and she was put in this room, she had an anxiety attack and she just started losing her breath and choking. So they kind of stabilised her. Anyhow, she stayed in for a couple of days and they got her back on a diabetes on the tablets and everything that she should have been taking that she hadn't been taking which started her off and um, so fortunately uh, she stabilized and you know the crisis was over and she was able to come home so she's at home at the moment she's overweight she's quite she's been a heavy smoker all her life so she's got to stop smoking now well she has stopped smoking and she doesn't walk really, so she started to go just for just walk up the street, which is a big thing for my mum. And but she's she's laughing and she's she, basically she's she's okay. She just needs to take take her time really, and uh, so I'm just glad she's home. She's got to go to for tests and stuff like that, so. So that's what's happened to my mum. Uh, I've been enjoying reading quite a lot. Um, I've done quite a few videos on Arrhenaeus. Um, those who know. So I'm going to talk about history now. Um, just for a few minutes and then I'm going to call it a day. I wish I could save the video. If you could save the video and send me a copy and if anyone's got a copy of the sermon that I did would much appreciate it if you could send me a copy you could Skype one of the guys um, be very grateful um, so I'm just gonna talk about history I got a book um, called the history of John Borrow, uh, published by Penguin. And for those who know, I've done quite a lot of videos on Dr. Richard Balcom, his book, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. If you type in Dr. Balcom, you'll be able to get on his website, read a couple of his articles. But also, if you type into Google Book Archive, you will find um, his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Now, in that book, he talks about. Um, Papius, um, the need to reassess Papius. Papius was important uh, because he was a guy who knew people who knew the apostles, and he talks about uh, this is quoted by Eusebius, the church church historian of I think it's the third or fourth fourth century A.D., and he talks about uh, Papius is quoted by Eusebius that he talked to these people who knew the apostles and that he was into eyewitness material uh, for, for writing about history. Now, I hope, I just want to say this because this is just important just to paint the background of why I find this fascinating. So basically what um, Dr. Balcom was doing is going back to these early historical source material like Papias that um, people like Boltman and scholars like that had just dismissed as not important. And he and so Balcom was reassessing that and also with I think it's Burridge uh, work where he had looked at surrounding historians, ancient historians, and saw that they wanted eyewitness material. And that's how they wrote history in the first century AD. So if the Gospels were written with eyewitness material, then what does that mean? And that's where Richard Balcom comes in. He goes into a theory that the Gospels were written by eyewitness material based on pa 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 uh, Papias and based on the way historians wrote in the first century. So that's the background. So that's what got me into history and thinking about the nature of history. And also, as you know, I've read the book by Michael R. Lacona, The Resurrection of Jesus, right? And that is about, a, a lot of that book, uh, is a lot, a lot of it is about historical method. 
Now, not a lot of not a lot of people know this, but before I went off my head as a young guy, um, getting into um, acid and going acid parties when I was about 19, 20, and going off my head as a as a young kid, I did do I did start an open university degree, and I specialised in history. One of the modules I did was in history. But I never took it up. I ended up being an idiot, getting drunk and stuff like that, and doing daft things as a young guy. So I never uh, completed the degree, but I did try to. I did a module on history and wanted to specialise in that. So I've always had a his, uh, an interest in history. Now, here's the point what I'm getting at. Now, this is the point that I'm I'm getting at is because of the new research that's been done last 20, 30 years by Burridge, by Balcom, by N.T. Wright, people like that, and many others on the left of the uh, concerning the Gospels and the first century his historiography. What I wanted to do, I'd already done some research on uh, Polybius. I'd already a bit of, read a bit of his histories to see what he thought about history. And he thought that if you're going to be a good historian, you have to go and get eyewitness material. So I've done a little bit of work on it. But what I want to do at the moment, my task that I've set before myself, is I want to read the main historians from the ancient world. And when I've done that, I want to compare their histories, why they wrote history, on what basis they wrote history and then compare that to the Gospels. So that's where this book comes in, A History of Histories by John Burrell. In this book, he, he about the major historians throughout history and he's writing about them and about how they wrote history, why they wrote history. And I find it absolutely fascinating. I really, really do. I find it really fa fascinating. Now, I take issue with him. I don't know what you think, but I take issue in the first chapter. The first chapter, I'll read a little quote. So forgive me. Uh, I'm allowed to do it from an academic point of view. So I'll just read a little quote. Herodotus, the great invasion, the historian's task. He goes, as was to become customary at the beginning of his work, Herodotus left us why he wrote it. That's his history. It was, he says, so that human achievements may not become forgotten, may not become forgotten in time, and great marvelous deeds, and some displayed by Greeks, some by barbarians, may not be without their glory. The two people fought with each other. Okay. Now. He says in the first chapter on his Herodotus the Great Invasion and the historian's task. Now here's a question. What do you think of this question? He says the first real historian was Herodotus. The father of historian of historians is Herodotus. Now when I heard that, as I get, began to read the book, and, and I was struggling with the book because the reason why I was struggling with the book because I, I just don't think the writer is a very good writer. I don't think he's he knows his subject as well as he thinks he knows it. I don't think I don't trust him as a writer. I don't think he's as, he's got the grasp of the facts that he thinks he has. And so there'll be a period, and I'll have to read these ancient historians for myself because I, I don't trust the guy's judgment because I just got a sense that that he's not accurate in some of the things he says, but he says that Herodotus is the father of his writing history, and I think that is absolute codswallop. I really, really do. Right off the bat, I think that's absolutely nonsense. And he mentions about uh, the Egyptians and about how they wrote history, but that's not real history because they didn't write it like Herodotus. Well, boo hoo hoo hoo. To me, that's just Western intellectual imperialism. 
to, to say that Herodotus is the father of history to me is an absolute disgrace. I think that there were historians before Herodotus. There were the Egyptian historians. Just with Exodus, you had um, the Babylonian historians. You, you had many historians. And they might not have been writing in the same vein as Herodotus. So I think that to, the point is this, is that when we make a demarcation in history, like for example this guy John Burrow, he makes a demarcation. He says the father of history is Herodotus. That's where he starts his history of the histories. But do you see that the fact that he stated that that's where it starts means that he has an agenda. His agenda is, is, is saying really that Western historiography is superior to any other kind of historiography because he's starting with Herodotus, he's not starting with the Egyptians, he's not starting with the Babylonians, he's not the cultures that go before that, before Herodotus. The second th question that is coming to my mind because so far I've read three tra chapters, one on Herodotus and forgive me for the pronunciation, one on Thucydides, forgive the pronunciation, and then another chapter on Poly uh, Polybius. Now, each of these historians had their own agenda for writing. Um, Herodotus was more um, lyrical in his writing. Uh, Thucydides liked to quote speeches and put his own spin on them. Uh, Polybius, Polybius had a desire to write uh, the history of Rome on a grand scale uh, as a history of the world. Each historian has a point that I want to investigate and then I'll shut up. I want to go back and I want to read Herodotus and I want to read all these ancient Greek and Roman historians for myself and also go even further back and read the Egyptian historians, the Babylonian historians and my, my, my task, my hobby is to go back and read all these ancient historians right up until the end of the first century AD and then I want to take all that knowledge and ask certain questions, how did the ancients see history? How did they organize their literature? How did they organize their themes? What did they see as important, etc.? And then I want to take all that historical knowledge and I want to apply it to the four Gospels. And how do the four Gospels relate to that, that ancient history? And that is a task that I'm working towards at the moment. I've only just started the journey in terms of reading the history of histories but I've got to get to read some of the more specific detail really um, so that's what I've been doing really I've been reading about history I've been reading quite a bit quite quite a lot actually about the early church fathers um, you can find the video I've, I've, I've wrote I've read a lot recently by Irenaeus. I've read his book against the, the, the her, against the heresies, a middle theological piece of literature. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's pretty hard going. It's pretty deep, and it's pretty profound because it gives you an a window into the Gnostics and what the Gnostics were about. Now. Modern scholars today, um, I've, I've mentioned this before, but you get scholars like Bart Ehrman, and they believe in a theory about the early church history, what is called proto-orthodox. Now, this proto-orthodox idea, uh, quite a number of academic scholars in the in the in the academy 
uh, take this on board. Um, basically, what the idea is that there was no authoritative gospels in the early church. There was a mixture of Gnostic gospels, and eventually one community became stronger than all the rest and imposed the four gospels, and that's how we get the four gospels. But there was no orthodoxy in heresy. Uh, it was just an eclectic mix of all sorts of things, and and so it's what is called the proto-orthodox theory. Um, Bart Ehrman and many many scholars kind of advocate this. Now, what I've enjoyed is, first of all, what I've thoroughly enjoyed is being able to dismantle this kind of scholarship by my own reading. I've really enjoyed reading Tischendorf's The Origin of Gospels, uh, which was written in 1862-64. Uh, and Tischendorf's work was absolutely brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. I absolutely uh, it was an absolute joy to read. Uh, it's only uh, 150 pages, maybe 200 pages long. Um, and in that book, he talks about um, the Gnostics, how they quoted the four Gospels. Um, he talks about the Moratorium Fragment, how that points to the four Gospels. goes into the nitty, nuanced detail about the Moratorium Fragment, because there's a book there that's not part of the the New Testament canon that said he's part of the canon. So he, he goes into the nuances of it. But it, it it was it was a book that absolutely demolished the scholarship of his day. But what is interesting is when I read C. E. Hill's book by Oxford University Press and looked at the research that he'd done uh, and the recent findings ancient rubbish tips in Egypt, I was astounded to find that all the work that Tischendorf did, who was a world authority in textual criticism in his day, in 1862-4, what I found amazing is C. E. Hill, uh, the research that's been found that he proposes backs up Tischendorf, so Tischendorf's book has not been out of date. What we found, or what I found, Reading Irenaeus myself in Against the Heresies, I found uh, a theologian who was massive in his understanding of the opponents. I found a guy who uh, quoted the four Gospels relentlessly. Uh, did you know that the early church fathers quote the four Gospels over 19,000 times? That tells you they were authoritative. At times, the early church fathers quote the four Gospels. Um, but the point that I'm trying to get at is reading Irenaeus for myself. He, he, Irenaeus is absolutely key in this understanding of who's right, whether it's Bart Ehrman and the proto-Orthodox theologians and scholars, or whether Orthodox Christianity is right. Irenaeus is a key player in this debate. How you interpret Irenaeus, how you understand Irenaeus, is fundamental to the debate. Now you get some top academic historians, such as Dr. McCulloch, who's wrote A History of Christianity, who's a, a brilliant scholar but makes crass statements such as, we can't trust Irenaeus because he's biased, which is the most pathetic statement I've ever heard a historian make in my life, because everybody's um, the proto-Orthodox scholars dismiss Irenaeus. But actually, when you get into Irenaeus scholarship, ooh, you get into some real deep waters. I mean, really deep. So you can hear uh, the proto-Orthodox scholars, proto-Orthodox uh, scholars make comments about uh, Irenaeus. You can read C.E. Hill make comments about Irenaeus. But my friend, when you get into Irenaeus scholarship or any of the patristics, you're in a massive field, and uh, you can't just quote one scholar, two scholar, and say you and and 
uh, and that you've understood RNAs. No way. You have to read. There's about eight or nine world authorities in RNAs that you need to read before you can be even begin to say that you get what RNAs is. On top of that, you need to read RNAs's book against the heresies two or three times before you can begin to speak authoritatively about RNAs, as far as I'm concerned. And so I'm working on RNAs at the moment. I've, I've read it. I've read the book once. I'm working on the scholars of RNAs. I've worked on one scholar who's a world authority, and I've got eight more world authorities to read. And that's on top of reading RNAs again, on top of reading uh, scholars that were in the 19th century, going back to Harnack and things like that. So there's a lot of work that I've still got to do on RNAs. Why? Because I enjoy it. Why? Because I've been making notes and I'm on my first chapter of writing a book on that. And so some things about RNAs, he quotes the four Gospels, he quotes the Gnostics who were quoting the Gospels, and uh, RNAs and the four Gospels were in the early fourth century, uh, first century. The other thing as well is I think also you've got to be very careful when you're doing things like this. Uh, the criticism that I have of Dr. Barkham and the criticism that I have of Burridge, who are two brilliant scholars that I really admire, especially Barkham because I know his work mainly, is what I find really interesting is they'll make comments, like Burridge will make comments about how ancient historians worked in the first century AD, and Balcom will, will make statements about Papias and how people thought about eyewitness material, but you know something? You know, I think that it's these subjects are massive, and there's so much material, you've got to be careful not to be too dogmatic unless you've done wide research and detailed research in the field and even people like Burridge or Balcom, there's so much to study that they're only just scratching the, the, the surface. So it's important because in debates, if you, if you were going to have academic debates with atheists, which I would solely love to do, uh, I was scheduled to have a debate with uh, John McDropout, I would absolutely love to debate the guy. But um, unfortunately, I can't get involved in debates if people, if I'm, if you, if I'm being dragged into these kind of situations of controversies, then you know I, I'm not in the frame of mind to. If you feel kind of under siege, and you don't feel you can get involved in anything, if if you're stressed out by these kind of things, but I would dearly love in academic debate and people have said oh conversations better the the atheists love conversation because if you notice if you notice most of these atheists if you look at making explicit uh, and people like that or any of these atheists no they will not debate and discuss people like me the reason why they will not debate and discuss with people like me is simple. And the answer to that is very, very simple. That is because they feel threatened. They don't feel threatened by the pillar box of this world. They don't three feel threatened by the uh, people who are are not sound theologically. But they won't dialogue with people who are trained in theology because even if they lost the discussion or didn't win the debate, at least they're going to present something, some, something substantial in terms of scholarship that people can go away, meditate and think about. And that is why the atheist community will not engage in debate with me. Uh, that is why Aaron Ra run away. That is why DPR Jones run away. That is why Thunderfoot run away. And that is why all these controversies keep coming up because the atheist community do not want me to 
reach these people to be able to debate them because if I did, even if I lost in debates, the people are going to be left with scholarship and evidence to go away and chew over. And um, I would take on uh, when they say, oh, Jason's an idiot and nobody listens to him and all the rest of it. I would take quite happily those criticisms on board. But the fact that the atheist community, or some sections of the atheist community, have tried to silence me means that I have got something. And it means that I need to keep my voice heard, whatever that voice is. Uh, that voice is to preach the word of God and to share whatever I've got to share. Um, so that's all I've got to say today. I just wanted to give you a little bit of think, a thought of where my passion is at the moment, where my interest is. Is the early church fathers, the patristics, especially the early people like Irenaeus, Ignatius, Polycarp. I'm really getting fascinated with these kind of characters, and I'm really working hard on doing research on them. And I've started on Irenaeus. And um, that's where my fascination is at the moment. And the other passion that I'm finding is the history of history. That is where I'm really getting excited and, and really looking towards. So that's where I'm at now. And um, there's nothing else to say apart from me just waffling. Uh, as far as what's happened over the weekend, um, Well, all I can say is I leave that with people out there to judge and to deal with it. And uh, I'm not going to get involved in any shape or form. Uh, I'm going to trust the online community and people on the online community to sort this out uh, in some way and that's what I'm doing uh, and I'm just going to chill out and enjoy life and get on with my life and be happy and get on and do what I enjoy doing and I enjoy preaching the Word of God I enjoy uh, I really enjoy that especially in in the city centre I can't go in the city centre at the moment because I feel threatened and in danger. Uh, at some later stage I will go. Um, so I enjoy that. I enjoy um, preaching on YouTube. And I enjoy having a laugh. And I also enjoy... Um, I, I would like once in a while to have a debate and I want to do some writing even though my spelling's not good so I'm just enjoying my life and um, I've come through a very long journey and I've come through the worst of it and you know the, bi the guy at church today did a, a preach and it was really good I really enjoyed it and he talked about moving on out um, forgetting what's behind and moving forward and you know I've had a lot of issues in my own life to work through and I've worked through them. I, I, I feel that um, I'm in a different place than I was a few years ago. And uh, I'm really a lot feeling a lot, lot better. And uh, I don't want to get into 
any unnecessary stress and I want to be at peace and keep calm and over the next few weeks because I can't go out preaching now because of what's so maybe I could go to some other place a town or something but I can't go into my own city centre at the moment um, but um, I feel that for me um, in my own journey in my own life that that it's, it's, it's a time to of, of getting ready for a new stage in my life and I don't know what that's going to be how that's going to be but I do feel that um, it's God who gets to decide my my journey it's God who gets to decide who I am and that it is about God and, and it's, a, it's for his glory and that's what's important to me is to do his People have voices and I appreciate them. People have their opinions and I appreciate them that people have said to me. But at the end of the day, I can only live my life and I can only do it my way. You've got your life, you've got to do it your way. For me to do it my way is to do it the way God wants. And I've come to a point where I really want to see what the next stage of my life is. It might be coming back to YouTube, preaching. It might be going to do more evangelism. It might be to go back into the city centre and uh, and preach. Um, I don't know, but I know that it's a time of getting closer to God, a time of getting stronger, and um, I'm hoping that some people saw because if I step in and say something it's just going to make it worse so I'm just staying out of it and I'm just hoping that people have the sense to realize that that something has to change um, from the side of where all this came from not just on my end but on on the side where where it came from so so that's where I'm at so I hope everybody's okay. I wish you all the best. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. And um, battered, but still standing. Um, bruised, but happy. Um, and at peace. So I wish you all the best. Um, love to everybody out there. these videos and pass them me on I would be very grateful alright take care and God bless have a lovely evening with your families uh, I say that to everybody um, even my enemies out there have a lovely evening and may God bless you all and uh, take care God bless this is Jay signing out had a couple of hours to spare, did a sermon, talked a little bit about history, and that's me. Alright, take care and God bless.